the approaches to credit nephilim formation in high level ways of process. And my talk will follow this overview. I first would like to mention a little bit what is material informatics, why we need it, and how can we use this. And then I will try to walk you through uh, materials informatics project step by step by using the Nephilim crystallization high level waste classes as an example. And let's start. And let's start with defining materials informatics. It is a buzzword. You will hear it every day. You will hear data science driven research, data science driven material science, materials informatics, big data, all of buzzwords, all of them are there. But what we are doing for a special materials informatics is we are using principles of informatics. We are using data science methods. We are using machine learning algorithms. And machine learning algorithms is actually a subcategory of data science methods. And we apply them to solve our materials related problems. So they are tools for us. We are not developing new algorithms to solve more complex problems. But how you are using SCM to take the image of a microstructure, we are using these tools to get a better understanding of the problem we have in our hand. And the difference between data-driven research and other fields of research is that we are using data as a source. We are letting data speak for itself, and we are trying to extract knowledge out of it. And at this point, I think it's also important to define what is machine learning, because it is another buzzword. You will see it everywhere. And in the simplest case, you let your computer, which is actually a software, not your hardware, you let your computer learn from examples it sees. And the uh, data science or data-driven algorithms that are used for this test are good at discerning the patterns and making predictions on large amount of data with high dimensionality. And that's the part that is different than what we were doing till now. We are working with high dimensional data here. And these models are better at seeing the patterns and making predictions on high dimensional data than we do. <coughs> and why do we need it? Just think a data point you created in your research for this month. How long time does it take? How many different measurements and experimental methods you use? And how many different information you get in what kind of length and time scales? Our data is heterogeneous and we are creating it and making it the basis of our knowledge for a very long period of time. But our data is very heterogeneous and it is very high dimensional. Until now, we could, have, we could answer some very important problems by just focusing a little part on this vast hierarchy of the materials. But now we are after solving much more difficult and complex problems. We want to attain new functionality in existing materials. We want to improve their functionality. And also, we want to discover new materials. And to do this, we need to go to all these different sorts of all this information coming from different source, we make the big picture and we should try to extract knowledge out of it. And this is why data-based models or uh, data-based tools <coughs> is uh, suggested as the fourth paradigm of science. I don't know if it is really a paradigm, but I know it may be very useful. And another reason we want to use these tools is because technology any kind of technology, you can't think right on this point, is waiting a better material. There is nothing like we did the perfect superconductor and, and we are done. It will never happen. As technology develops, we will need better materials in every step. And these tools are very useful in accelerating the materials discovery. And that's another region, reason, starting from 2015 with, with material genome initiative, actually for acceleration of uh, discovery of data, these uh, models start to be used more frequently. And the beauty is we can use them in any step in our basic challenge. What is ba our basic challenge? We want to understand, and since we are dealing with more complex problems now, understanding is not enough, we need to quantify 
the relationship between the processing characterization, uh, after processing structure properties and performance. We have to do this. And with these models, actually, we can do it in a predictive manner. So we can use, for example, our processing parameters as inputs. And then we may have a model which predicts the structure. And it can go on and on like this till we reach performance. But this is not the only way we can use it. Whereas we can work with these forward models and uh, form a cause and effect relationship. We can also work backwards too. So we can find the properties which can give us the performance we need. Or we can find the structure which will give us the properties. Or we can design or optimize the processing which can give us the performance we are after. In comparison to forward models, this is a more uh, engineering point of view. And what you, are, what you are dealing with here is an optimization problem. But these tools can help us doing that. And another beauty is you don't need to do it step by step when you are working with the data. You may just jump several steps and find the relationship between performance or processing or vice versa. So these are the tools that helps us understanding these relationships starting from wherever we want. And there are many different tools of them and there are many different ways to actually classify a uh, classify machine learning algorithms, but the most useful one is actually using the uh, define them or classify them based on the data and the problem you have your you have at hand. And these are supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and unsupervised learning. Supervised learning is what you do when you fit a curve. Now you know your target variable, and you want to obtain it as a function of your input variables. If this is the problem you are working with, you are working with this, you are working on a supervised problem. That means your model will learn from what it sees in the past, and then it will make the connection between your target variable and your inputs. And there are two different uh, types of supervised learning algorithms. They are uh, regression and classification. Regression is if your target variable is a numerical one. For example, you want to predict the mean precipitate size as a function of aging conditions. If, if this is the situation, you are after a value, a numerical value, and what you are working on is a regression problem. And if you are working with label data, what does that mean? Let's say you are working on a uh, compound which has polymorphs, and that, these polymorphs are called A, B, and C, and you want to predict which polymorph will be stable for the given conditions. So what you are doing here is working with the labeled data and try to predict a binary output like this is A, this is B, or this is C. And this is the classification studies. Another uh, good example is doing it before you run an experiment to see if your experiment will succeed or if it will fail, because success and failure will be a binary output and you may use your experimental conditions to see if your experiment will be useful or not, or successful or not. The other one is unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, we don't have labels or target variables in our data. So this is more exploratory. Uh, this is most the part that we start with when we are in the beginning of a materials informatics project. We look into our data and we try to see if there are any patterns. And to do this most of the time, we need to do for something called dimensional reduction. Because as I said, we are working with high dimensional data, but we can only visualize the data up to three dimensions. So whenever you have a situation like that, just visualize your data, you need to apply some dimensional reduction. And again, I will use the example of SEM. For example, when you have an SEM image, actually you apply dimensional reduction because your structure is in three dimensions, but you are looking into it, looking into it at a two-dimensional level. And this is the same thing. We are decreasing the dimension of our data. And after that, we search our data to see if there are any clusters. Clusters are uh, similar to classes. The difference is they are not labeled, and we understand if two samples in the same cluster or not by looking at their proximity in our 
GPU's uh, future space. And finally, uh, we have reinforcement learning. It is uh, mostly used if you have both labeled and unlabeled data in your uh, data set. Okay, this is a very nice picture, but of course we have some problems too. And these problems start with data type. These are good tools and these are good for working with uh, heterogeneous data. However, our data is very heterogeneous. We have images, we have tabular data, we have point measurements, and all of them are different. And you need to express them in a way which is easy for you to interpret and understand, and also it is easy for your model to use. So, because of this heterogeneity, we need to do feature engineering very extensively and at every step of our informatics project. And this is not a general way of machine learning application most of the time. Uh, moves forward. Secondly, data volume. We have small and sparse data because the way we generate data is expensive and it is time consuming. And till 20 years ago, we never thought of this way of doing research. So we had a question in mind, we designed an experiment, we get its result, we get its result, and then we interpret it. But now, when we are using this, actually, what we need is a uh, dense data and we need it to be in larger amount. And most of the time, when we have 100 data points, we say we are making it. But for general machine learning algorithms, this is not the situation. Thirdly, domain knowledge. It is both a challenge and an opportunity. It is a challenge because you cannot just have a predictive model if it's against thermodynamics, if it's against kinetics, if it's against physics. Your model should follow the rules of nature. So just having good predictivity is not enough for us. But it is not that way for a general machine learning algorithm. They are okay just working with correlations. If the prediction is predictive accuracy is good enough, they can move forward, but we can't do that. Why we can't do that? Because we want to interpret them. We want to learn something from our model. <laughs> These models are good at some, are better at something than us, and this is seeing the patterns and making predictions. So why don't we use their uh, way of decision making and extract knowledge out of it? We can use this domain knowledge, which is the opportunity part, to both interpret our models, or we can even use the interpretability of our model to refine our domain knowledge. So these are both challenges and opportunities. And finally, uh, um, not by an actor, there's one more. And another one is uncertain to quantification. This is again required if uh, another machine learning algorithm makes a mistake, Spotify offered you a bad song, you either pass it or you listen to it. It is not end of the <coughs> But as engineers, if we cannot define our uncertainty, and if our model makes a wrong prediction, if we are lucky, we will only lose time and money. But we are engineers and our mistakes can end up disasters. That's why we need to know uncertainty in our models. And this is another difference between general machine learning algorithms or uh, projects and the way we use it. And finally, the goal. The goal for us is extrapolating machine learning algorithms. We want to discover materials. We want something which is not already in our data set. And this is a challenge because this is not the normal way of machine learning algorithms work. Machine learning algorithms mostly match. You show it tons of cats and dogs picture and then you again give it a cat. You do not train the model with cats and dogs and give it a goal and ask what is that. But this is exactly what we want our machine learning algorithms to do. And this is another challenge for us. And now I'm moving to workflow. Uh, this is a brief introduction to materials informatics. And now I will walk you through the workflow and how we use data driven models to do uh, materials research. And I will use the example of nephilim crystallization in high level based classes. So this is the workflow. This is 
Where do we start and where do we end? We start with data extraction. It is the data collection part, but also it is the part that you are framing your problem. And it is followed by data exploration. So we look in our data, we try to understand their statistical distributions, we try to look at the correlation between our features and if we have target variables. The third part is data reduction. It is the most time consuming part. It is the part that we will use our domain knowledge most because this is the part that we engineer features and this is the part that we select useful features. And the next part is modeling. This is uh, you choose a model and now you train it, you develop it, you hyper tune it to have the best model. And if you decided your model good enough, you move to evaluation of your model with the data that it is not seen before. And also, this is the part we are looking inside our model to understand uh, something out of it is uh, decision making to extract knowledge from its decision making. So data extraction, as I said, we have lots of different sources of data, different source of uh, different types of data and different data structures. And they can be all in your data collection. What will determine what you will put in your data is not actually your problem. And if you are lucky, you can find the data which will help you with your problem. But this is not the always situation. So most of the time, this goes in a feedback loop. So you collect data and you look at it if it is good for answering your questions. And then you go back, you do it again. At, at one point, sometimes you see that whatever you do, you cannot have the good enough data which can answer the question you have. And now you will need to be creative. You will need to understand what you can earn from that data to be used as a step for your forward goal. And for our case, uh, for this study, we work with nuclear waste classes. They are immobilized nuclear wastes. They are uh, bore most borosilicate classes. And uh, we immobilize nuclear waste in the glass because glass has uh, chemical durability, mechanical integrity, and is thermally stable. So it can help us keeping this radioactive waste away from nature for thousands, maybe millions of years. And this is uh, the topic of the project that we will talk today. And most of the one I will walk is high level waste classes, which means it has high radioactive materials. So, we vitrify our nuclear waste, and then the vitrification comes as an option. And it is not something we want, but it happens. Especially high level waste classes are prone to it because they have high alumina, high sodium, and transition metals. And especially if there is high alumina and high sodium oxide, after you pour your uh, melt to large canisters, in the center line, the cooling rate is very slow, that actually the conditions for precipitation and growth of nephilim is provided. And this is not something we want, because nephilim removes glass formers from the structure and it affects negatively the durability of your glass. So we want to predict, avoid, and if it is not possible, limit the amount of nephilim formation. And of course, when we are doing this, we want to be cost effective. And to be cost effective, what we need to do is increasing the waste load. But when we increasing waste load, we also need to be careful about not risking the durability of glass. And here comes the dilemma. Higher alumina amounts are useful for forming uh, for higher waste loads. However, when you increase alumina amount, you also increase tendency to nephilim formation. So actually your risk for chemical durability is increasing. So the problem we have here is an optimization problem. We need to find the highest alumina that we can have in our glass without forming nephilim. And this is the first step of our problem definition. And after this, in order to frame the problem better, of course we need to Visit literature, we need to do lots of reading, and we need to look with a uh, critical eye what other people do about this problem before. And when we do this, actually, uh, we face with five different models. 
The first one is Neferin discriminator and it is called single descriptor. It is a single descriptor because it is a standalone value and based on a threshold you decide if Nephilim will form or not form. <coughs> and the second one is using this Nephilim discriminator with optical basicity because it is shown that optical basicity can be an indicator for tendency of aluminum silicate precipitation. And when these two use together, now we are using two single descriptor together just for any uh, optical basicity as a critical threshold. And if you are higher or level, you make your decision. But the second model offers use of using these two together. And both of these are very, very useful in determining if Nephilim will form. So they are very good at not taking any risks. However, they are overly conservative. What does that mean? If we make our glass composition design, based on outputs of these models, actually we will eliminate lots of high alumina <coughs> amount glass, which actually do not form nephilim. So this is the reason why people did not stop there, but start to look for a better way of predicting nephilim formation. And of course, not only studies are all on uh, form constraint models or classification studies, but people were uh, doing systematic studies to understand effects of in individual oxides. And these studies show that there is a very <coughs> nonlinear interaction between oxide amount and nephilim formation. That's why art an artificial neural network model is uh, developed, and it has very good accuracy. However, the problem with artificial neural network models, they are like black boxes. It is not easy to extract knowledge from them, and also it is not easy to uh, quantify their uncertainty. And since this uh, artificial neural network models show some uh, differences in its accuracy between different data sets, it gives the impression of the model may itself is not, is not stable. And the fourth and fifth models are very similar to each other. Uh, they are forming submixtures, which are, they are bringing together the similarly behaving oxides. And uh, out of their linear combination, they are forming the corners of a sort of target phase diagram. And then they are fitting a curve on the boundary of uh, the on this phase diagram where nephilim forming and not nephilim forming glasses are separated from each other. And then based on this curve fitting, they are making their decisions. These are good models. Uh, they are, some of them are uh, very risk. Uh, the fourth one is more risky than uh, fifth one, but fifth one has also has some problems. So there are still rooms for us to develop better models. But the, I, but the important part is both 4 and 5 has very similar accuracies and there is no reason or no explanation why two different models have very similar accuracies. So based on literature and based on what we want to achieve, we can finally decide how our model will look. Our model will be a classification model. Based on its input, it will output Yes, Nephilim will form. No, Nephilim will not form. And I know it is kind of counterintuitive, but I will keep saying not Nephilim forming negative and Nephilim forming positive because presence is mostly named as a positive and uh, absence is negative, although we want just the reverse in the end. This is the uh, linguistic that is used, so I will uh, keep using it. And this will be the output of my model. And my inputs will be, again, just like other studies, have the compositional space. And in addition to this, I would like to add the heat treatment related parameters because we are working here with, with a nucleation and growth phenomena. And as a physical methodologist, I cannot just say, no, I won't take any heat treatment related parameters. So the input space will have compositions and heat treatment related parameters in it. And of course, because of the application and further uh, former studies, I have some other uh, critical aims. For example, I cannot have a model which has an accuracy less than 91.2%. 
And also, since I don't want to have a very risk model, I cannot have a misclassification of nephelin forming glasses as not nephelin formers. The lim I have a limit there, <coughs> and this limit should be 13.7%. And these are called false negatives, so my uh, model named them as negative, but actually they were positive, so they are false negative. And this ratio is what I need to keep low. And this is the uh, part that we frame our model. And this is the part that we finish our data extraction. The other part is data exploration. Here we are trying to obtain large information about our data in a very simple way. And to do this, we are using descriptive statistics, and we are using it both for both our targets <coughs> and input variables. And when we are doing this, we are also uh, starting feature engineering or data reduction a little bit, and we are uh, trying to find correlations between target and independent variables. And I started this part of the study by uh, looking at the correlations, and since I have a uh, binary output, uh, my options for uh, quantification of correlation is kind of limited than a uh, numerical value. So I work with point by serial correlation. And when we do this, the first thing we see is there are more negatively correlated oxides than positively correlated ones. And there is a clear cut that if we look further, probably we can obtain some knowledge out of it. And that's the part where we decided to look at individual distributions of an, of an oxide amount in our different classes. When I say different classes, I mean the classes which form nephelin and which does not form nephelin. And when I look at the distribution of alumina or distribution of any oxide in this, we saw there are four different associations. The first one is a stronger association. These are the uh, box plots, which are summarizing your distributions very efficiently, and the line in the middle is the medium of this distribution. And the strong association, I based the, uh, my classification of strong associated or not strong associated oxides on this medium. If the difference between the medium of uh, nephelin former and non nephelin former glasses is higher than 5%, I name it as a stronger association. And if the, if it is higher for uh, not nephelin former glasses, it is a strong positive one. If it is higher for not nephelin former glasses, it's a negative one. But we are not always very lucky. We also have oxides and we have lots of them. They show no proof. Um, no sign about their effect, their distribution is exactly the same, their median is the same, so we cannot really say anything about them. In addition to this, there are oxides which are in only very limited number of samples that we can't even plot a distribution curve. And finally, we also uh, define something we call implicit association. That means the medians are almost the same. So you cannot get, gain any information from that side. But when we look at the distribution, we, we can see there is a difference. And the narrower difference means that it, is, it has some tendency to promote that kind of behavior. For example, the sodium oxide you see here has a very, uh, not very, but smaller width of distribution for not nephelin forming glasses in, form, in comparison to nephelin forming. And as a result, I will call it an implicit positive association. And this, this is the point that I actually finished the exploration of data, and I started to data reduction part. Data reduction is like dimensional reduction. We do lots of uh, feature engineering. We transform our raw data into something which is meaningful to us, which is interpretable for us, and also which is useful for our models or easy to use for our models. Although it calls data reduction, it always starts with adding more features to your data set. You actually increase your dimensionality before you decrease it. And this is the part that we uh, apply our domain knowledge a lot. We try to come up with more uh, 
better features we can summarize or explain what is happening other than individual features. So we combine them together and we try to obtain something different that we don't have in our trace. And after that, we are doing feature selection and elimination because high dimensionality, although the tools we have can deal with it, is not a perfect thing for us. There is something we call curse of dimensionality. If you have so many dimensions, especially in cases like meta, uh, material science data with uh, small amount and sparse data, most of the time you make your model very prone to overfitting. Overfitting means your model memorizes it does not learn. And if it does not learn, it cannot have a predictive power. So it is something we always want to eliminate, we always need to be very careful about. That's why almost always we will have a feature selection study. And also there is a part of it which is called feature extraction. It is obtaining a new coordinate system out of your uh, variables. There are many different ways that we can do. Uh, to achieve that aim and also feature engineering if you uh, use all of your existing features together can be a part of feature extraction too. So the first step of our feature engineering after we uh, distinguish that associations we thought why don't we use them? It is like getting together the uh, similar effects and making them have a bigger effect. And if we can take the difference of two big effects, maybe we can create a descriptor like ND or OB, which is standalone, can help us identify, uh, help us classify glasses as not nephilim formers or nephilim forms. And that is, the, that is exactly what we did here. Uh, we call this parameter difference based on uh, correlation because this is how creative we are. And then uh, we try to have some combinations of our associated features to have this parameter DC because we did not use all of the oxides which shows correlation, but instead we use the best subset we will hear. And in order to choose the subset, we use it is standalone accuracy for predicting Nephilim information. And it is the first feature that we add. After that, we added some heat treatment related feature. We digitalize cooling curves and uh, we express the time spanning on each important temperature range. And after that, we put all of our data together. We have around 60 features in that plot and we try to understand how useful they are in terms of the prediction we want to make. This feature selection model is not the best to select the best features, but it is a very good one if you want to eliminate some features which are not so useful. And this is exactly what we did here. We eliminated some of the features which does not seem to be very effective. And with that, we, uh, we finished our data reduction part for now. Oh, I'm sorry. After that, of course, we go and try the feature extraction. For that, we try to create our coordinate taxes by using many different uh, reduction models. And none of them is actually worked the way we want them to work because none of them gave a clear cut between Nephilim forming and not Nephilim forming glasses. But instead, they showed us that there is a high overlap between these two different class we have. And after that, we moved to our modeling. Uh, the modeling part is selecting your uh, model, train your model, develop your model. It will be, again, in a feedback loop. You will do it with your feature selection or with your model evaluation. It, it will not end before you are done with the project. And after you choose your model and after you develop your model, what you do is fine tuning. You need to uh, tune the parameters in your model so that it works uh, best for the problem you have in your hand. Because sadly, there is no single recipe for a single kind of problem which tells us these features will work best, these models will work best with those kinds of features. That part is a trial and error, and you need to try as many models as possible until you reach the best one. 
And this is exactly what we did. We tried many different models, but we also included our feature selection in this one too. Because again, said the no recipe which says that this model and this features should go together. You need to do it every step, your feature selection in every step. And in the end, we reach these features, and the model we have is a decision tree with a boost. And then we come to evaluation of our data. Here, uh, there are different ways we may follow. Um, one of the most frequently used ones are having a train and test split or having a K fault cross validation. Uh, train test split is simple. You take some part of your test set and you never let your model C till you come to evaluation. Uh, feature selection, training, all of them are just a non-training set. But most of the time we are not that lucky because we have limited amount of data and we want to use as many of many samples as possible to train. So we mostly follow K fold model in which you uh, form K different train and test set from your data. Train sets will be used to train your model and test sets will be used to test your model. And you do it in a way that each of your samples are at least once in the train set and at least once in the test set because it tells you how your model will work if you have seen a different sample that it is not in, the, uh, in, your, in either of your sets. And when we do this, uh, we use two different cross validation. One of them is thousand different train test sets, so it's a thousand fold model. Uh, it is not something done very frequently. But after uh, we see that there is overlapping, we want to be sure about the distribution of our accuracy in different test set, and that's why we try thousand different. And actually, we were not wrong. Uh, there is a distribution of accuracy in our different test set, and when we look at this, we actually first see that among our 400, uh, 747 glasses, only 72 of them are classified wrong as uh, false negative and 72 of them were as classified as false positive. And when we look even deeper, we saw that 28 of the glasses which are uh, classified as false negative are wrong more than 50% of the time that they are in a test set. And then this will use 35 for our false positives, and that means this 28 and 35 glasses, we can either our train set if, or either rest of our data set is not representative of these glasses, so whatever we do, we won't be able to predict them correctly, or there is something else happening. And in order to see our first uh, part, if it is true or not, we applied another cross validation which is the one out in which you use only one of your data points as a test set and you train your model with the rest of your data, but you do it as many times as you have samples in your data set. So for our case, we trained 747 different sets to obtain only this, uh, oops, sorry, to obtain only this accuracy value. This accuracy is actually the mean of our thousand different uh, train and uh, test set model. And when we look at the samples which we misclassify here, we see that they are the same samples that we misclassify 50% of the time. So yes, we cannot predict these classes correctly, regardless of what we do. And in order to see, okay, there is a problem, our accuracy changes, how I can give people an uncertainty. And to do this, we actually again visited the data reduction part, and now we use now we use only our uh, f five features, and we actually express them in two dimensions. And when we do this, we see our problem. We have a part where which is mostly correctly predicted nephelin forming glasses. Next to it, we have an, another region, which is rich in terms of nephelin former glasses, but there are also some not nephelin formers, and when our not nephelin formers are in this region, 
we correct them wrongly. So this is dissolved too. And also we have another reg reg region or zone. It is rich in not nephilim forming glasses, but there is also overlapping, especially if you <coughs> come close to boundary between zone two and zone three. There are some glasses which actually does not form nephilim, but they are close to the nephilim formers. And then finally we have a fourth region that we are very happy about, not nephilim formers, and we can predict all of them correctly. So in order to give an uncertainty, we uh, provided this zone analysis as a part of our study, and we told them that if you are at zone one, 96 of the percent, you, are, have, you have an FLE forming glasses, and it is very probable that you will predict it correctly. And even though you mispredict it, it is uh, highly possible that you won't be missing too much. And actually in that region, there are only two glasses that we could not predict correctly. And when we go and look into details of these glasses, we actually see them. They are having other crystals than Nephilim. So there is a reason that they are in that part of the uh, uh, PC zones, although they do not form. And we can do similar analysis for all of our zones. And in the end, we see that our accuracy is actually lower in the regions when we have overlapping. And outside that regions, we have a prediction that none of the uh, models can reach, but probably they cannot reach it because they are suffering from the same problem. And after this, we come to analyzing our models and try to understand it is decision making so that we can extract some information out of it. The way to do it starts with looking at global feature importances. Global means you are caring about all of the uh, samples and you are trying to understand which of your uh, features is more effective to give the right prediction. And for these actually, uh, we see sodium oxide is one of the most important one and it is coming from the uh, fact that our model, uh, for the way our model works focuses on the samples which are more difficult to classify and this feature importance tells us that the glasses which are difficult to classify uses sodium oxide most frequently to make a decision. And then we may uh, just normalize all of this uh, difference in our model and then we can uh, look at overall future importance by using permutation and when we do that we see ND is uh, our most important feature and it's followed by DC and sodium oxide and we can do it in a manner where we have uh, <coughs> where we look at the individual samples one by one and when we do that we see in our decision making if you have a uh, correct uh, positive prediction all of your features are actually supporting this but if you have a wrong prediction there is one feature only one feature which says no it shouldn't be here and this is the probably the reason that uh, the feature which actually is the reason of the different behavior in the actual data set, but it is dominated by our other features during the model, and as, as a result of, they end up in having the wrong prediction. So with this, I can summarize that uh, we have the highest alumina attainable model, and we did it without sacrificing any uh, accuracy. Our model has the uh, same accuracy or slightly better accuracy than most of the models. And we also noticed that the accuracy is changing according to where you are in your feature space. And this is, the, this is because of the uh, presence of overlapping region, regions. And also we, at this point, after our model analysis, we can say that overlapping regions need to be eliminated from other parts and they should have their own classification model to attain a better accuracy throughout our process. And now this is the ongoing work that we are working on this project and finally I would like to thank our collaborators and our funding agency and I would also like to thank you for it.
questions? Question about uh, glass or about data science in general? How long do you tend to spend on data reduction or dimensional reduction in the process? Actually, um, I show it like a successive thing, but till you say, okay, I have a good enough model, you are with it. And even after you evaluate your model, and for example, it tells you sodium oxide is more important, then you start to, you go back and start with the interaction of other oxides with sodium and sodium oxide, and you try to, again, even that point, you try to come up with a better feature. So it is all throughout the process. But if, let's say, this project takes a year, it takes a year too. Can you adapt this model to start looking at other ceramic phases that will start precipitating out now? So you have it really tuned for napoline. Yeah. But can you start using it to see any other parasitic sort of uh, Of course, if I have data okay. for the compositions I have about precipitation of other <laughs> form, other crystalline forms, Yes, I can. Yeah, and for example, it um, the zone one, the misclassified glasses having other crystals in it. It also verifies something uh, said in the literature that the different crystalline phases also affect each other and how they, will, which one will crystallize. And like that. So yeah, even it's this study enough alone can be an input for another model to create right. our crystal. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? I know you've done other work. Uh, so in this particular project, you're looking at composition as your primary input. Mm -hmm. What are other examples of projects and uh, other attributes that, that you've worked with for uh, similar type? Okay, uh, I worked on a microstructure project in which uh, I actually did lots of data reduction so that I don't need to uh, use images as data inputs out of them. I uh, determined some structural descriptors and I used that so microstructural features could be an input. Other than that, I have two studies in which I only use the FT data that is either collected from literature or generated. And uh, for them, I use the elemental properties that we can find from periodic table to uh, see if a compound is stable or not. Or also, and also I use these, again, elemental properties uh, and other features that you can obtain from them to estimate the error that you will have um, in the result of a DFT calculation when you are calculating the uh, entire, I'm sorry, you are calculating the lattice parameter of an oxide. And now we are working on a project uh, where we use again the composition and aging conditions to estimate the thermal behavior in nickel titanium shape memory alloys. And also we have another project where we will use microstructural similarity as an input to find the relationship between the uh, processing history and thermal behavior, again, in the compact shape and well. I thought talk will you thought more questions? Or not? How did you select your parameter for only 13.7%? Oh, it is, it is from the literature. Uh, since these are used in the literature, they are saying that this is what we need to have. We cannot have anything more than this. And I think they are doing it based on risk factorization or something like that. I don't know. It's just a part of a, a department of energy, yeah. long term goal for, for waste storage. So there's, there's a, a national level uh, requirements. And the important thing is here we are all saying yes or no, but a further goal should actually be how much nephelin is really detrimental. Because I think it will be the main point where we can attain higher alumina amounts. Because yes or no is still kind of conservative. And this will be a, another goal which we will need to use a regression study to solve. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, 
We'll do two more questions. Uh, please help me thank our speaker again.